Just days before the anniversary of activist Marielle Franco's assassination in Brazil, prosecutors there charged two former police officers with her murder. The arrests may provide a partial answer to the question of who killed her, but many other questions, like who ordered her killing and why, remain unanswered. This week, we talk with Ifat Saskind of Madre and KK Verdade about the current fight for human rights in Brazil and the right-wing hate campaign against so-called feminist gender ideology worldwide. Then we take a look at one demonstration in New York to remember Franco and the struggles she brought to the world's attention. That's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Gender ideology, as delegates to the UN's annual meeting of the Commission on the Status of Women well know, a mysterious term has started cropping up in human rights debates. It's the assertion that replacing the word sex with gender is part of a global feminist conspiracy to destroy the family, ruin society, steal your kids, and who knows what else. Gender ideology is something that the reactionary right is keen to stir alarm about, and it's having an effect casting feminists and their friends as enemies of the state and influencing elections, like last year's in Brazil, where new president Jair Bolsonaro has promised to remove LGBTQ content from the high school curriculum as part of a greater purge of what he calls Marxist rubbish. What is the U.S. role in all of this, and what are in-country groups doing to fight back? A woman with a front seat to what's going on is Ifat Suskind. She's the executive director of Madre, which partners with grassroots women-led groups from Nicaragua and Haiti to Kenya, Palestine, and Iraq. Old friend of mine, Ifat, welcome to the program. It's been a while. Before we dive into the gloom and doom of what you're up against, I think it is also worth taking a moment to reflect on what you think's been accomplished over these years. Madre's what, 35 years old? Madre is 35 years old, um, in some ways doing exactly what the founder set out to do in the 1980s. The world has changed, strategies have changed, principles have remained uh, rock solid, which I think is what, what the organization uh, owes its success to. Um, and I think that, that the success of Madre is the success of, um, of radical social movements all around the world. And, um, and that we are seeing, especially in this moment, a real kind of flowering. And you know, I think many of us who are in this work are, have a sort of you know, best of time, work, worst of times kind of feeling about where we are in the world. Into the middle of it flies this new term, but a sort of familiar scenario, something scary being talked about that puts a lot of that work at risk. Gender ideology, when did you stop hearing about it? You know, I think that it's good to locate the beginnings of gender ideology way, way back in like 1994, 1995, and those two years being the, the UN uh, conference in Cairo on population and development and the year after being the Beijing Women's World Conference. Um, and I say that because I think that those two moments represented kind of um, a watershed in in feminist movements winning, feminist yeah. women w movements winning, a kind of mainstreaming of what they'd been what they've been claiming all along, and starting to see that reflected in women's rights, are human rights, reproductive justice ideas, LGBT is part of this whole story. Right, and so what now is being called gender ideology really started way back then. Um, and it began on the part of the Vatican and other, you know, kind of groups that, that play a, an extremist yeah. um, role inside the UN system. Um, I think, though, it's important to understand why we're talking about it now, right. which is, as you said, um, it, it has a kind of new lease on life, this sort of shape-shifting term. It's really just a container for anything that the re religious right doesn't want to see happening. Um, and, um, and it is, as you said, a really important galvanizing term right now and really has a lot of utility um, for authoritarianism. And that's why we're seeing its strong reemergence. How are you seeing it play out in the places that you work, maybe in the groups that you work with or ones that work with them? 
Well, I mean, uh, I give you just sort of an anecdotal example. We were recently talking to a partner of ours, a group of indigenous women in Guatemala who are doing amazing, amazing work um, reclaiming areas of land where their parents and families were massacred in the 1980s under the watch of the likes of Elliot Abrams. And those communities of women are, are dealing with the generational trauma by doing Mayan ceremonies on these pieces of land and then doing incredible things like building playgrounds and turning them into soccer fields and food gardens. Um, and that work of indigenous women in Guatemala very recently was designated as witchcraft by an evangelical church in Guatemala. What we know is that overwhelmingly, both in Latin America and in Africa, a lot of the right-wing religious organizations, churches in those in the communities of our partner groups um, are, are funded and receiving marching orders from U.S.-based evangelicals and, and religious right-wingers. And when I say marching orders, I mean things like they will get grant money from a church in the U.S. on the condition that they disassociate from progressive groups. Mm -hmm. In Brazil, we heard, I had a chance to interview the leader of the opposition, Haddad, and he described the statistics they had, they had uncovered on who voted. Something like one in three of the voters in the presidential election in that country last year had been mobilized by a Pentecostal church. Um, most of them with relationships to the United States, and this language of gender ideology being bandied about uh, constantly. Well, how do you tackle it, and how do the people you work with tackle it? I mean, I think there's a few layers of what, how we respond, and the first layer is protect people who are under attack. Absolutely. I mean, it's the same thing that we're doing in the U.S. right now. Right. What what are the circles of support that we need to be we need to be building? And a, and a frontline thing is making sure that people whose lives and communities literally are under attack are receiving protection. Um, but also, as we're um, generating that kind of resistance, always, always remembering that we can't only be resisting, right? We have to hold on to like, what is the vision that we're trying to create? And that is of a society where there is space for feminist ideas about, you know, how we want to live and what our family should look like and what is the role of government and how, what is the responsibility of government to a diversity of, of a citizenship, all, you know, that whole gamut of questions I think we have to keep as kind of like a North Star of like we're not just reacting against the reaction of the right wing, right? right. And I think that we know that that the the way that, that gender has, has functioned so far has been, um, you know, one of the most powerful tools of, of patriarchy, which is to keep, you know, to, to keep women subservient, to, to say that there is no role in this world for people who are gender diverse or who have a sexual orientation that's not heteronormative. The right is sending around things saying in advance of the UN meeting, for example, beware, real women and girls need to stand up against those who are trying to hijack our issues with their transgender agenda. That's right. That's right. And I think that, you know, in, in the lead up to the CSW, I think one of the things that we are on alert for um, is a real concerted attack specifically against trans people. Um, and we're seeing that right now in the U.S. It's almost like an existential kind of attack, right? Like we're just going to erase the category of, of trans um, in, you know, on the part of the state. Um, and, and that's certainly true in Brazil and in other places. And we're looking for, to see how that's going to play out at the U.N. But we're expecting it because they are, the right wing is going after what they perceive to be the sort of weakest link um, of the feminist and LGBTQ, you know, sort of m movements. Um, and I think it's a real call for people to um, rally around that community uh, in, in solidarity. Ifat Suskin, thank you so much for joining us. Ifat is the executive director of Madre, about which you can find out more through our website. We are here at my home with a very special guest who's just in town from Brazil for a few days. Her name is Keke Verdade, and she heads up the Ellis Fund, the largest women's foundation in Brazil. They're up against it in that country these days, but a lot of what they're facing will not be so unfamiliar to those of us in social movements here in the U.S. Tell us a little bit about what the Ellis Fund uh, does. Let's start there. Well, at Ellis Fund, we are the only women fund in Brazil. And so these days we are, we are already 18 years old and we are supporting 
uh, women-led organizations and LBT-led organizations. Uh, around, I would say, eight, uh, 80 or, uh, grantees per year. So what kind of groups, what sort of things do they do? Well, they work on advocacy for women's rights, like stopping violence, also LBT rights. We have a lot of groups that are facing now, um, trying to push to stop racism in Brazil, black women-led organizations, and um, young women organizations also, trying to break this stereotype that young girls cannot lead, that they don't know very well what they are doing, you know, so all of this. All of this work, I'm sure, brought you into close contact with someone we think about deeply at this time of the year, around the world, I think, Mariela Franco. She was assassinated a year ago in Brazil. Tell us a little bit about her, how you knew her, and the significance of that assassination. Yeah, Marielle Franco was an amazing person, amazing activist. She was very close to all of us in social movements, and uh, so she was representing us in this legislative power. She embodied all our fights. She was a woman, she was black, she was a lesbian, she was from a favela, you know? So, specifically voices that are not heard in our politics in Brazil. So, her assassination last year was, uh, was very traumatic. Uh, well, I could say a lot about the person, but I won't because I don't want to cry with you now. And uh, she was a, a close friend. But I would like to say about the, 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 the trauma that it, it was for social movements. You know, she was representing human rights movements in general. So when she got assassinated, uh, we couldn't see from our government action, you know? And actually it felt for some social movements like a straight message against those voices. These people cannot be participating in, in, in policy so much, you know, in politics so much. So it was really traumatic. So fast forward to the fall of last year, Six months after the assassination of Mariela Franco, city council member in the city of Rio, we have the elections. And we have the election of Bolsonaro. What can you tell us about him and the relationship between those two events, or, or were they related? After her assassination, we start to listen in, in social medias and uh, around society in general, a lot of hate speech. Hate speech starts to rise in Brazil, which was not, not common mm. at all. So there is a lot of hate speech, including against Marielle, mm. talking things like, oh, probably she, she, if she was from a favela, probably she would be connected to uh, drug trafficking, for example. There was a lot of hate speech against LGBT community, as uh, for a, a misogynic hate speech against women in general, mm -hmm. it seemed that uh, the people who were engaging in this hate speech, actually, they were supportive of Bolsonaro's uh, candidacy, you know. So now he's elected, and what are you seeing? Well, then it went even worse. Because once he was elected, somehow these people who are spreading hate speech, they felt in a comfortable way, you know? He, they felt comfortable and legitimized, mm -hmm. you know, by his election. And so we are seeing this hate speech uh, getting more brutal and, uh, and each time more easy to find, you know? So I would imagine that you are kind of on the front lines of all of this visible, leader of a women's foundation, focused in part on LBT issues and LGBT issues. What's it like for you, just on the streets and then in your work? I mean, it was complicated because we were, I mean, there was something so crazy about this uh, hate speech and fake news. I know you, you have experienced something like this in the previous election here. Um, so they were connecting, for example, women's movement to left 
uh, wing parties, for example, mm -hmm. which we know that is not like that, right? We know that women's rights are difficult to achieve, even if an, yeah, a left uh, party is in power or a right party is in power, doesn't, I mean, there are no guarantees mm -hmm. that we are going to achieve women's rights, right? But some of those um, hate speech were against activism. Mm -hmm. And there is also now an uh, atmosphere of <coughs> criminalization of social movements. We see uh, rising a bit of uh, repression against uh, social movements from, from this new government. And, uh, and there is, of course, a lot of demands and needs from democratic social movements uh, led by women, you know, towards allies asking for support, you know, in, in many ways. So we know in this country that our media tend to portray hate speech online and aggression against you know, social movements as sort of a naturally occurring phenomenon. How do you explain it? Are there visible sources of this aggression towards your groups, meaning organized sources, or, or is it just random individuals? Well, I would say that our uh, main concern about this is how this hate speech or this intolerance becomes a public policy or become uh, uh, main strategies of our government. You know, so for example, in terms of, uh, we used to have a women's ministry. Mm -hmm. We no longer have, it was mixed together. Women's ministry and human rights ministry, and then they have added a family minister. And then they say, for example, that to put all this together means that human rights are no longer for minorities. Now is a broader perspective, human rights for everybody. I don't know what you think about this, but we fear a lot because uh, it's a perspective that the previous understanding of human rights was, uh, was like just for a few people or something like this actually is not like that. And, um, and also there is this family uh, concept coming up, you know, like, and what they understand by family is this very narrow perspective of a family. It's just a man and a woman and their children. Other sorts of families are no families at all. So you're hearing much of the same things that we hear here. The response to Black Lives Matter is, well, all lives matter. Police lives matter. The response to LGBT people asking for their families that have always been excluded to be recognized is to say all families should be recognized. By shedding differences, you miss the discrimination that's happened and, and you're really incapable of addressing it. Exactly. This is our worry. Are because it is becoming public policy. Are you hearing this term gender ideology? Oh, yes, Laura. And what does it mean? What are you hearing? I mean, they, I mean, they say that gender ideology is to tackle any sort of gender inequality or talking about diversity. So if you try to make these conversations at schools, for example, it's like, seems that you are representing a political party. And they say this, so they say that this is a specific group ideology. And that is a single understanding of, uh, that we tend to believe that uh, men and women are different, but they are not. You know, that everything is fine, that we should not tell uh, boys and girls that they can choose their gender, for example. So, I mean, they mix a lot of concepts. It's like, it's like a, the fight that they have against gender ideology is, feels for us, of social movements, a fake news, you know? Mm -hmm. Because they, they misunderstand all the, uh, the whole idea of human rights and, and gender equality. It sounds very much like what we saw in the States in the early 90s, where right-wing organizations, especially media organizations, released videos and programs about the gay agenda, which was their take on 
LGBT people asking for any rights, any equality. There was a insidious, dangerous, scary seeming gay agenda. That's what gender ideology sounds like to me. A sort of scary agenda coming out of feminism um, or an attempt to foment that kind of fear. Does it, does it work? Yeah, you, it does work. And what they did by saying that there is a war against gender ideology is to forbid in all uh, public policies of health, of education, to have any of these terms or concepts, you know, there. So, for example, you cannot have gender written in any policies. You cannot have uh, sex orientation, sexual diversity. You cannot have even race diversity. You cannot have those terms anymore. And it's all under this big flag of war against gender ideology. What do you do? And, and, and how have social movements in Brazil been responding? And then my next question is, how can we help? How can social movements in the States perhaps help? We are in Brazil very interested in, in, in rising some international solidarity. And I believe that uh, the case of Marielle Franco's assassination is one opportunity for us to engage internationally. You know, we see, I mean, it's been a year, we don't have answers from our government. She represented all democratic social movements and all this diversity of opinions. So I think it's an opportunity for us to engage. I think with international support, we definitely can get more answers for this assassination. So bring us back to the streets of Brazil today and how you are maintaining your spirit to do this work. Um, what is it like for you in the streets? And will it be safe for people to be protesting around the assassination of Mariela this year? Yeah, thank, thank you for bringing this. Actually, what we have seen is that some of the protests uh, have been repressed in any way. So one of the main needs of, of women's uh, movement these days would be for security, for improving security, uh, digital security, or even physical security is some of our concerns. Probably you know that Brazil has a very experienced and vivid women's movement, very diverse, and uh, that has been building this recent democracy since the 80s. I think the, the, the hope for changing this into a much better society relies on our social movements, relies on those uh, women's um, movements. And what we have is to be in alliance and strengthening our, our fight. KK Ferdadje, thank you so much. It's been wonderful talking to oh, you. Oh, thank you. We followed some of the protests that took place on the anniversary of the Mariela Franco assassination, and this is what we saw. <laughs> All over the places in the world, all over the places in Brazil, people are celebrating the life of this such an important woman to us. She represented and she still represents our Brazilian culture. We will offer the ceremony to her. She was a good daughter, sister, mother and wife. All! Marielle! Your name is Joy! I am one of the leaders of the Defend Democracy in Brazil committee that we founded three years ago before the coup d'etat that happened in Brazil 2016. We brought together friends and people to celebrate the life and the legacy of Marielle Franco. Uh, we brought here today Marcia Tiburi, who is a writer, a feminist, a very important feminist and, and thinker in Brazil, she's a philosopher, and she 
who works and she uh, had a struggle with Marielle in Brazil for many reasons. Bo together they created a partida that was a very important uh, initiative of feminists in Brazil. Also Adja Jones who is Brazilian, American and she came to talk about being a, a Afro-Brazilian woman and honor Marielle. Valdemir Juventino, the robot, peasant leader of Rondonia for June 2017. And I brought together the flowers, the candles to honor Marielle and to keep the fighting for democracy and social justice in Brazil. We really need to tell the world that what's going on in Brazil is going all over in the world and we need to share this world and bring people together. Maria, 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 é um 